bring the chat back. There we go. All is well in the world. Yes, you can ask a question. Go on. My name is Red. Yeah. Can you hear me? I, yes, I can. Yeah, I think it's uh, irrelevant to ask the question right now. So I'm just going to ask you, you know, later. If that's OK. OK, sure. All right. All right. I think we're meeting tomorrow, so that maybe that's a better time to talk about it. OK, all right. <clears throat> so. Um, today we're going for the stats boot camp number five. It's data frames. Um, as you know, we're going to keep on with this. I just uh, mentioned that we'll just continue weekly after a two week pause. If, uh, if you're aware of anybody who has started using R and wants to. Wants to um, learn basic statistics, part two of the boot camp sessions seven through 12 is going through all sorts of um, traditional statistics, things like simple linear regression, one way ANOVA, correlation, how plots and um, uh, other graphics work in R and about how um, about how uh, to choose the the best practice kind of graphic to match your statistics test. Uh, we don't go into any advanced stuff, um, but I have lots of material for that. So maybe we'll continue if people want to continue with it and there's momentum. So feel free to forward the link. I think everyone can forward the link or if you know somebody who might want to continue attending and pick it up, um, just have them email me and we'll do it. All right, so um, what we're talking about today is data frames. This is what you call a uh, data object once you read it into R. It's just a bit of, of R jargon. And um, this is one of those things that I get a lot of questions on when people do start using um, R because it it isn't as easy a, as it is with some programs to just read in an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, maybe it is these days. It has gotten easier over the over the years, and I'll show a couple of different methods for doing this, and it works for all sorts of data. Um, but no matter what, the first step for any analysis is, is getting your data into the software. Now, uh, the other thing we're going to really talk a little bit about today is the notion of, um, of tidiness for data. And in fact, it's it's a thing, tidy data. So um, I'll introduce that idea if it's new to you. Here's what we're going to go over. We're going to go over some common data file types, and I'm going to say a little bit about um, best practice for data storage. While uh, if you're like me when I was a student, um, I felt really lucky, even privileged to uh, just have any data in the first place, and I, I did collect quite a bit of data during my PhD, and I worked with other people to collate data. And um, I developed this, this practice of um, splitting that data up into different files. So maybe I would uh, rearrange my data and I would save it to a different file. And I, I might call it, the first file I might call data. And uh, then the second file I might call something like data rearranged. And then I might make another file that was like data two. And then I might have one that was called data two final. And then I might have one that was called data final three. And it would just go on forever. And I had, you know, many sets of the same data. So uh, we want to avoid doing that. And uh, one way to avoid doing it is to um, to uh, think a little bit about how we want to store our data, uh, how to set it up. And um, we're going to introduce this concept of the data dictionary. Then we're going to talk about the different ways that, um, oh goodness, there goes my sleeve again, the different ways of getting your data into R. And then finally, we'll do a little live coding and talk about um, how to manipulate variables and get some information about them. And then we have some practice exercises if we have time. OK, so <clears throat> I want to say a little bit about this tidy data concept. I have some graphs which I'll um, show you 
about tiny data in a second, some pictures anyway, and we'll work with some data that are in tiny format. And I'll show you some data that are not in tiny format. But uh, the whole point of this is that uh, if we have what we're going to call tidy data, the whole point of it is that it is a format for archiving data that is accessible. Now, what do I mean by accessible? What I mean by accessible is a few things. Um, one thing is that the data are transparent to others, that it's useful to others. And uh, when we're talking about others here, I introduced this concept of um, best practice for this kind of work, reproducible statistical analysis, reproducible scientific results. Uh, transparent to others means, in this case, that uh, there might be some person in the future the person in the future might be able to leverage some extra value out of your data. Now, this future person it may be important. You know, they may be uh, an important professor or something somewhere. They may be uh, another researcher working on an important problem. They may be your future self. Because uh, after you you consider some question you're asking with your current data set, there are times in your career you may want to come back and add to an older data set. Um, so we want to document our data itself so that it's it's useful to all these kinds of different people. Now, um, the concept of tidy data was uh, defined and is credited to this guy, Hadley Wickham. Now, he currently is the head of statistics at the company Posit. Now, if you haven't heard of the company Posit, I may have mentioned it before. It's the company that was formerly known as RStudio. They're the company that have paid for um, the development of RStudio desktop that we all use. They have developed a lot of our packages, including the Tidyverse, um, ggplot was the package that Hadley Wickham developed himself while working at RStudio. Um, and some people refer to Hadley Wickham as a um, as a data science rock star these days because he he has influenced uh, our notion of best practice so much um, in modern times. So he he wrote about this concept of um, tidy data in a paper now now getting old, but still relevant. And he just laid out. Uh, what he meant by it. And one feature of the data that he talked about was that um, each row were a collection of uh, independent observations. And each column were different features. So um, this kind of graphic is a picture of um, a ledger of of pay for some farm workers. Each row in this case is an independent observation of a of a different worker. And each column is the stipend they received uh, at a particular month for the year. The thing you might infer from this table is that it's quite old. You know, it's a it's a couple thousand years old. <clears throat> And uh, so then you might question, did Hack Hadley Wickham really invent the tidy data concept? No, he didn't actually. It's been around for a very long time. Ledgers like this uh, are the foundation for the way we think about data, the way we still use best practice. And Hadley Wickham, the rock star, far from invented it, but he was the first person that really clearly articulated uh, what it was and uh, why we should all be using it and why we should uh, demand that it's used from colleagues. I want to talk a little bit about data types, um, uh, data file types. Uh, data files affect the way we store our data. And my own thinking of this has changed over the years. So I thought I'd allow myself to explain to you why that is and, and mention a couple of things about it. One of, for a long time, I believe that the um, separated values format, uh, you, comma separated values, this .csv file 
is one of the commonest in um, in Britain and the United States and Western Europe. Um, in some other places, they use other other uh, characters to delimit their files. So you may have heard of, um, you know, tab delimited files. Um, you may have seen semicolon uh, delimited files like that. Um, and, and there are other ones. There are just space, simple space delimited files as well. Um, for a long time, I viewed these as the pinnacle of uh, file storage or or tabular data. If it if it was too small or um, low in complication, so that you didn't need a, a real database, then uh, I thought that this tabular data was the best. For many years, um, I did, and I demanded everyone that I work with use um, plain text. So um, here are the reasons why I felt so strongly about it. Uh, one, any computer system fast, slow, any operating system can handle plain text data files. It's one of the, the simplest data files. Um, now, because of that, it's very accessible. You don't need any special software or anything to, uh, to read the data. And because the text format, plain text, has been around for a really long time, the amount of time that your data will be viable in the future is probably pretty long, um, whereas a piece of software, a proprietary piece of software that invents its own data format, um, the software might change or the software company might stop working and it might be hard to get a hold of the software so that you can access your data in the future. Or maybe the software is expensive and the, the place you work buys it, but you get a job somewhere else and you don't have access to your data anymore. So these are all kinds of reasons why I um, did it. Another one was that the size of text files was very small compared comparatively to Excel. So if I compare all of these things to Excel in the past, um, Excel had a had a fat, porky file size for exactly the same data. It wasn't accessible. Because um, you know, in the past, uh, not every place had the same version of um, of Microsoft Office. It's it's relatively very standard these days. Very different now than it was um, when I started thinking about these things, and and it just wasn't as stable as plain text Excel. But I have changed my mind uh, now. I think that Excel is uh, just as good as CSV for one big reason is that now Excel. Um, Excel files, the Excel file format um, is open. So it's it was open, made open source by uh, Microsoft, and um, it really increased the usefulness of it. Another thing that I used to really dislike about Excel is that um, the size of the file issue, the the file and the program itself were they were so lardy that uh, it was just irritating if you had more than microscopic data and it, they started taking up lots of space you know back back in days when we had to worry about um, space on our computer a lot more than we do these days but uh, that also has been fixed and excel is now very efficient um, they have used good software engineering practices to avoid the lardiness another thing i like about excel is that um, you can embed extra tabs uh, into it to be able to embed a data dictionary with your data. What is a data dictionary, you ask? I'm glad you asked. I think before I go into a data dictionary, uh, maybe I'll just mention that a, a data dictionary would take a, a bit of data like this and it would explain what is meant by sample. It would explain what is meant by sample ID. And uh, without that, we were just given this kind of sheet of um, of an Excel spreadsheet. It'd be hard to figure out or guess, let's say, what R RT even was, unless we could ask someone who created it, unless they were there to explain it to us. And uh, if we look at other aspects of this particular data set, 
this is a real data set that um, I believe that this was the very first data set that, that someone brought to me to help them analyze it when I started working at Harper. And um, a few things that I noted about the Excel spreadsheet is that uh, one is that it was very tidily organized. You know, someone had really thought about how they wanted to organize the data. They had made a few graphs. They had made a summary table. They um, had created these tables and had made these structural lines that contain some information. They had this sample um, table and in they embedded some detail about what the uh, what the units of measurement were for something, but uh, that didn't seem to match the rest of what was in this column. Turns out that um, there were two factors that were sort of combined in this one column. One is a is a um, genus of um, plant pest. I think those are aphids. If there are any entomologists, kindly confirm in the chat if you know those are aphid genera. And then there was another one that was an experimental treatment where um, there were some some um, treatment levels that were added. So they've combined and crossed in the same variable those different things. And they were measuring something with uh, a gas chromatograph. They've got the peak area of some kind of uh, chemical that they were measuring and, and so forth. It just went on. So, uh, you know, when I joined Harper, I, I was used to seeing a lot of Excel spreadsheets like this, and I still am. I see a lot of Excel spreadsheets like this, but I looked at this and I knew a lot, we'd need to do a lot of work before we could actually do any analysis on this data. Uh, so some of the characteristics are that um, I mentioned the thing about combined factors. I mentioned the thing about um, it, it's, it was hard for me to tell what this even was, the RT. I also noticed that like this variable, is almost invariant. Yes, thanks, Megan. Um, I thought thought I remembered distantly they were aphids. So there's almost no information in in this column whatsoever. That's irrelevant. Some kind of concentration here. Uh, one of the big ones is that to do anything sensible, we'd have to separate the information in the treatment and the and the genera. Sample ID, I noted, made sense. These were individual samples, and so. In some ways, these rows um, are okay, but uh, in other ways, there's just a lot of wasted space um, in there that makes them hard to read. So they all say GC19 dash, and then they have a, a sample ID. So there's a lot of redundant information in there. And because each of these are on their own row, um, the numbers themselves are redundant. By, fact, by the fact that they're in tidy format on a different row, we don't need an ID. The rows themselves are the IDs. So there's a lot um, of those things just about the data table itself. But another thing is that there's some weird characters in the variable names. There's some a row here that's blank. There's embedded stuff in the table, um, some kind of summary that's just hanging there in the table. And also there are these uh, graphs that were embedded in the table. So for all of those reasons, um, we couldn't analyze this, and so we have to do something about it. It's not tidy. That's untidy. So here's a version of the same data set that uh, IDs are left intact in case those are important for some kind of internal thing. The aphids are um, separated out. The treatments are separated out. The RT was left in, but um, this, it turns out, was an intermediate calculation for um, calculating these two things over here. And uh, as was this peak area, it was an intermediate to calculate these other things. So it was really these things over here um, that were of interest. And uh, notice down here on the cell spreadsheet, you've got a dictionary tab. And if we just have a look at the dictionary, um, we have quite a lot of information here now about um, this is just a generic one about the conversion that was made to create the variable. So it's just a little note to that respected, important person in the future who might make use of the data so that they can make some sense of it at some time. Someone that you have respect for, someone that um, you haven't been able to explain every little detail about. So remember, that person might be you. You might forget 
all these little details. So we have uh, a little account of that for every variable. This is the basic format with a with a data tab and a dictionary tab that's a, a minimal requirement for best practice or tabular data storage these days. I prefer Excel, it could be any format. The advantage of Excel is that you can embed the dictionary with the data file, otherwise you have to embed it in some other way and it's probably in a separate file. So we need to think strategically about such things. This is a uh, tidy comma separated values format of exactly the same data. The, um, it looks a bit messier to our eye, but it's organized in exactly the same way, has exactly the same information. And of course, natively Excel will display it to us in a more aesthetically pleasing way. And the way Excel would display it is exactly like this. Notice something else that I didn't mention when I was on this is that I've changed the variable names to uh, not have any spaces, not have any weird characters, and um, to uh, but still have the same descriptive information while being short. Okay, so that's another aspect of of tidy data. All right, so that's that's tidy data. Um, I mentioned that getting data into R is often the first hurdle that uh, people have, and um, it's gotten easier over the years. And um, one I, I should have put on here, but I didn't, which maybe I will demonstrate, is um, read.csv, which is one of the staples um, for, for all of these, or uh, read table. Uh, together with uh, the other things that are on this page, um, we can read in almost any kind of data. Uh, and I'll show you some others that you can do. Um, now, one way to, to do this, you have choices. One way you can do it is through the menus, and I'll demonstrate reading in some data from the um, drop-down menus in RStudio. You have to have RStudio for that, um, but natively R will um, read in with functions. Now, um, to read in Excel, there's no native function in, in R, so we need um, we need either the read Excel package. That's the official one that um, that um, the company Posit created and that they um, they recommend using. And the function that you need is read underscore Excel. Now, before that existed, I started using this one, open XLSX and the function read dot XLSX. Um, I prefer this one for various reasons. Um, prefer it out of habit because I've used it for a long time. I prefer it because to me it is more intuitive to specify which you have a complicated spreadsheet, which tab and which um, cell range you want to do in. But again, that may just be habit. Um, do I any other little thing that I could say that I prefer about this one is one one very minor one is it's easier for me to remember the name read dot excel because it's similar to the native r functions for reading other file types i'm just going to demonstrate um, some of these ways let's just bring up um, r studio real quick i don't think i have r studio open i thought i had that open okay i'm just going to open up r studio real quick And I might have to close out of my project, which I do. Let's do that. And it's thinking, so I'm going to begin a um, an R script. I'm going to just set up my R script in the usual fashion. Fourteenth of Feb, um, Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Okay, so um, here's what we're going to do first. I'm going to go to the um, web page and scroll down to the section where we're 
reading it in and I, I think I have a um, a um, a file that we can play with and, and download it. So uh, here is is a link uh, and I'll just put possibly um, you go to section four. There we go. There we go. I'll just put this in the chat so you can find it easily if you like to follow along like that and it'll bring you to this section. <clears throat> All right, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to download this file. I think if I just click on it first, uh, oh, it did, uh, I had it downloaded natively. So I'm just going to open that and um, just going to um, cut that file. And um, I think for this demonstration, I'm just going to do something like, um, like putting this uh, on my desktop. So I'm just going to um, drag that out there. There we go. And I'm going to come back up to uh, our studio. Now, one thing I wanted to show you is how easy it is to uh, read in data from the desktop. Before I read it in, often it, you know, I've just downloaded this file off the internet. Of course, um, I might want to peek in it before I read it in, just to make sure it is what I expect it is. And it, it's just like that, um, that file that I, I showed you. Notice it's a CSV file, but it opens up natively in my computer, um, like it would for most people. It opens up natively in, um, in uh, Excel. But if I if I close this real quick and right click on it and um, say edit it in Notepad, what we'll see there is um, that format that I that I showed you a picture of. Okay, so it's just text data. So one thing we could do in our studio to read this in is we could go up to the um, file menu and go to import data set. Now I can't make the text for this bigger, so apologies for that. Um, and notice that we've got a few options here. One is to um, import from text with an option, base R way. One is to import from text using what's called read R way. We could import from Excel. And also natively, we could bring it in from SPSS, most of you will know about that proprietary software. Now, uh, I think it must be for years, um, SPSS had a closed data format and uh, IBM, the, the computing company bought SPSS about 10 years ago, maybe, maybe a bit more. And uh, I think at some point they realized their software was dying and they, they changed their practice in some ways. And one of the ways is they, They've made an open data format. So th this is relatively new to natively be able to read in SPSS data files from R. Um, SAS is a very popular um, reproducible programming language for statistics uh, that is very expensive historically. You can use it for free if you are using it for research or as a student or instructor at a university. But uh, it is not better than R. I, I started my programming in statistics um, career using SAS and used it for a long time. But it really has lost some of its shine now. But yet, a lot of people have old data sets in SAS around this world. Stata is another one. So these are the only ones. One that you'll never see on here is GenStat. It's got a closed data format, and very, very few people on the Earth use it. Uh, other less used software packages also will, will never make it on here, especially if they've got proprietary formats. Okay, so I'm just going to hit from text because CSV is a text format. Let's see what happens. We're going to, um, to um, go up to my desktop. I can just click on it. Let's see what happens when I click open. Gives me a, um, a little, a little, uh, graphical user interface, and it's asking me things like, um, what is the format of the text? Well, in, in 
there are a lot of them, but uh, in this case, the data look pretty good on the automatic setting. Does it have a heading? What that means is, does it have a, um, a um, row with variable names? By default, yes. Um, does it have row names? Now, this is automatic. Um, in some text data file formats, there is the first row does not have a variable name, and it has um, it has uh, row numbers explicit. Uh, I just came across this with someone. I don't know if if that person is in the chat, but we kind of caught that in a problem, and we that was an error, and because all of the column names were shifted. The separator here is comma. We could pick semicolon or tab or just plain white space. Um, the decimal is by period, some places in Western Europe use comma and other places in the world. Quotes, if they're used, are double quotes. Uh, comment, there's no comment column. NA strings are designated by NA. Of course, there are no, uh, there are a couple of NAs in there as well. It's detected that possibly um, automatically. And then um, do I want it to import strings as factors? That's just an option. That's a relatively new option. We get a view of what we're going to get if we choose all the defaults. We can see the raw data up here, and we can see what will result. Looks pretty good to me. Let's see what happens if we import it. Three, two, one. <laughs> it um, it doesn't like the fact that uh, there's a um, five, or maybe it doesn't like the fact that there's a dash uh, in the title. So let's try that again and let's see if there's an option. I don't use this method of getting the um, files into R very often, but uh, let's go down to import data set from text. Is there a place where we specify the the name of our data? Let's try open. Don't see a place where we specify the name other than up here. Let's try to give it a name that's like um, like uh, my data. I think I know what the problem was. Does anyone know what the problem was that our was trying to name our data object five dot tidy. Does anybody remember what the problem might be? Anybody uh, have an idea? You can't start a um, name with a number. Can't start a name of a data object with a number. So I suspect now this will be okie dokie with the passive aggressive Butler. Let's try it. Three, two, one. Bam, we've got our data in. It's opened a little spreadsheet. That's annoying that that's default. And we've got our data here. Just going to demonstrate what that might look like with um, with a, a function. One thing that we would have to do is to um, set our working directory. It's uh, the desktop on my computer, which is C colon users slash ed slash desktop. Uh, but you know, maybe while we're thinking about this, I might go to the session drop down menu, set working directory to source file location. But I haven't saved this, so I'm just going to save it first. I'll save it to my desktop. Let's go up one. Let's call this um, bootcamp five. There we go. Now we can do session save to a source file location. There we go. So it's set my working directory to the desktop. You can see down here in the console. And uh, I'm going to just make a new data object that um, we'll call this my data to you. And uh, to do this, we'll use that other function that I had on the slide, read.csv. And uh, we're just going to remember the name of that, which was um, <clears throat> Five tidy, I think. Was it five tidy? CSV. We'll see in a moment because it's free to do a little experiment like this. What should happen when I run this is the Butler should place my data two up here, and it should also have eighteen and seven respectively for rows and columns. Three, two, one. There we go. So two ways to accomplish exactly the same way. Let's go back and index the old slide. I think I um, will go back to the web page and see if I have an example um, coming up here. So we've talked about um, read Excel and open XLSX. Um, in case you have to install it, we would need to use the install.packages function. Just make this a bit bigger for people. 
I've talked about um, setting your working directory. You might want to work through this on your own. This is often one of the very frustrating parts of using R, the notion of a working directory. So I, I'm not going to belabor the point now, but I strongly recommend going back and reading this part of the lab and practicing it. Um, it'll it'll be helpful to practice a few times to stick it in your mind. But the idea of a working directory is simply that um, the working directory is the first place that the passive aggressive butler looks for your data file. You want to open a data file, that's the place it looks. So that's kind of the concept. And generally, if you have a project where you put your data files and you have a project where you put your R script files, and probably in that same folder, you might put your your outputs like slides from a talk you were going to make from a data analysis or even a report. All of it would be in that project folder, and that project would be your working directory um, set like this. There are some other ways to do it. So the other way to do it is to use the set working directory function, and I, I think I'd talk you through that as well. So practice that as my recommendation. I'm not going to go through that right now in the interest of time. So um, I also have a, an Excel file. I'm just going to save as. And I'm just going to save that. That's 5-tidy XLSX. I'm going to save that um, just uh, to my desktop also. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk through this code. So I'm going to click the clipboard, copy it. Okay, so um, so I have a an explicit set working directory command here um, for a place where the data lives. Uh, even though I wrote this this code several years ago, um, I was just talking to someone about my use of Dropbox, which is quite dangerous, and I uh, I'm willing to take the risk most of the time. But um, one of the reasons I take the risk. Um, of leaving a lot of my my working files in in Dropbox is because I know the structure very well. <clears throat> but uh, in this case, I'm going to show you how to how to use the get working directory command. I'm just going to make the text a little bit bigger for you. Um, what get wd does is uh, notice there's nothing inside the the um, brackets. Oftentimes, when we're learning to navigate the R system. We might want to know where does R think my working directory is. So the, this get working directory command should print out where it thinks it is, and it should print out um, user Z desktop down in the console three two one. So it does. So I don't happen to need this set working direct command, but um, I'm just going to comment it out. So I've already got my. Um, set working directory if we did change it we could test it again so we don't really need that command now either because we didn't change it what we're going to do is um is uh, read in an excel file now to read in an excel file i mentioned that we need this package and um to install packages we use the install.packages function this is the way that i like to do it i showed you another way last time in the packages tab over here let my packages load up and we could click install and we could we could type in open xlsx we have a um a um a prompt here that uh, has two different suggestions the suggestions here come from the official r packages database cran and uh, we could install it this way. We could choose open SLXS, XLSX, hit install. I think it's probably true that I already have it installed, and I could just scroll down to the O's of all my packages. Very rich with packages. Past O's, though. There we go. So I can see that I do already have it installed, and I, I could also just load it by clicking this box. I can load and unload packages that way. But just um, just to show uh, demonstration, 
what I'll do is I'll go ahead and reinstall OpenXLSX. The, some stuff will happen down in the console, three, two, one. Um, oh, I think it's because um, I need to put that in quotes. There we go. And it says that it's installed successfully after it's um, dumped a lot of text. By the way, this dep equals true argument um, sets the the fact that the the dependencies if a if a particular um, package re relies on some other packages by explicitly setting dependencies to true we will also download those other packages um, if we need them we can just kind of look on the install packages uh, help page and dependencies by default is set to um, na so uh, it's it's always safe to set it to two true. Another little thing I'll point out in passing is notice that the name of the argument is dependencies, but I've only specified dep, the first three letters of dependencies here. So I'll just mention that um, our the R system in the attempt to be user friendly will allow um, will allow abbreviations of any argument name inside any function. And as long as the number of letters you supply are unique compared to all of the other arguments, it will accept the abbreviation. So uh, the traditional one for this, the R style for the DEP argument and install package is one that people use a lot is, is DEP. Um, and then we have to load it. OK, so to load ones, you can do it the, the graphical user interface way, which is very slow, or you can um, do the library function on the name without quotes of the library. Three, two, one. <clears throat> I get a little warning that um, OpenXLSX was built under R version three, uh, 4.3.2. That makes me wonder, well, what version of R am I running? This is one of the irritations. So it looks like I'm using 4.3.1. Um, I think I have downloaded 4.3.2, but um, have it set to the slightly older version for some reason, but I don't want to digress on that. So uh, what I do want to do is demonstrate the use of the um, read.xlsx function. So I'm going to call this one my underscore data, and I'm going to use the read.xlsx with a quote. We know that that file is on the desktop because I saved it there. We know the desktop is my working directory, three, two, one. And I have yet another version of that data object, all identical, but by different names. So they all occupy different regions of space. So then that's a brief overview of just how to get your data in if it's in Excel format or OpenXLSX. And if you have your data in one of those other formats, um, you could use the drop down menu or there are um, function versions of that too. We're not going to go over those um, just now. So I want to go and um, have a look at um, yes, I didn't mention that. That is in the um, that is in the the R lab. There's quite an annoying thing for Windows users. It's only only really affects Windows users. Is that uh, in the Linux file operating system that um, we use um, <clears throat> we use a particular direction of slash. To denote our file names, if I just go here and and click on my um, my my window up in this part of the window for this directory I'm in, which is in my downloads directory. Maybe I'll just click up to my to my um, desk uh, my desktop real quick. <clears throat> if I just click in there. Um, I think I'll go there the um, other way. I'll go C users ed desktop where I've saved this junk. If I click in there. You can see that path. If I go back to my R and I just paste in my path um, like this, and uh, you can see how it is spelled. If I use the get working directory, um, 
command, you can see that my path is demarked by forward slashes as opposed to backslashes. So this is something that um, has been a bother for our users for, I mean, I have been aware of it for, I, I hate to even say this, um, but I have been aware of this for uh, about 26 years of my life that I've used R. This was one of the first things that I noticed when I started using R in the late 90s that I was asking myself then, why don't they just fix this for Windows users if they want Windows users to use it? And if the whole point is it for, for it to be easy to use. But uh, you may be unaware that in um, in operating systems based on Linux, including modern Mac computers, that um, they use this forward slash notation for, for um, file structure on your computer, but Windows uses this backslash. But the R system, which is based on, on the Linux operating system, requires you to use the forward slashes. So if I try to set my working directory, and I um, try to set it with my backslash, it's, excuse me, it needs to be a character string. If I go 321, I get an error. And um, the error is because that backslash um, symbol is is um, is reserved. So you have a couple of choices. If I uh, just copy this, one choice is that uh, we can put another slash on each of those. And yet another choice, so we can change the backslashes to forward slashes. This is... Um, this has been an irritation to me personally for many, many years, decades, <laughs> and a lot of other people as well. And it, it cre makes it really hard for new users to start if they use Windows. So uh, either one of these will work. We'll try both of them. Um, maybe I'll just um, do one, three, two, one. That one works. And we can print out the desktop. And this one will also work without complaint, three, two, one. So that also works. Get working directory, it didn't change, but we'll get that error every time. So uh, that's a good question. It, I do cover that in the lab a little less explicitly than I just did. Um, <clears throat> okay, I mean, a, a thing. I, one last thing I'll say about this is that I usually these days, maybe I've, I've grown soft in my old age, I usually suggest that you save a a script and for new users i just think it's easier to use the menu you save your script and set your working directory with the drop down menu to source file location the reason I, I don't love this method it's not the best method it's certainly not the method that i use is because every time you close down a script and you're working on some other stuff and you come back um you you would have to do the drop down menu again when you open your r script and to me, that's annoying. And it is faster if I'm going to work on an R script in more than one session to just go ahead and set my working directory in code. Um, now, I, I have, I'm out of the practice of even doing that. I used to do it for almost every script. But these days, I usually set a project um, for most of the analyses I work on. And if you use an R project, we'll cover this in a future session, it automatically sets your working directory to the project folder location. So it's a little bit it's a little bit more convenient, but it's a little more advanced to use projects. So I'll hold off on that. Okay, so that's the whole story. All right. So I have uh, I think one more significant slide, and we're almost out of time. So I want to get to it. And I'm not going to bring the whole um, slideshow. I'll just do it on this. And I want to, I just want to show. A couple of um, a couple of functions. These are utility functions in working with data frame objects. Now, um, a thing that I didn't explicitly point out, but I'll do so now. Is what if I made a variable called x and I just put the number two in it? Um, we get a little visual hint in the global environment that these three objects, my data with an underscore, my data no spaces in my data too, they're in a section called data. And that implies that they're data objects. But um, 
we wanted to explicitly ask what any object is, we would use the class function. So I might um, use the class function and ask, well, what kind of data object is my data? And it's a data frame. It's an R data frame. It's the basic data frame that we use every day in R. And if I asked what uh, what class the X variable is, we did this last time, it's a numeric and we would get one for any kind of variable, but the X is down in a section called values because it is a, it's a data object, the kind of which would fit inside of a data object. So a, a data frame object. So a data frame, one of the unique things about it is that every column so-called can hold a different kind of uh, class of object, whereas a matrix or a vector can only hold exactly the one class of objects. One of the unique features of a data frame. I think I have some uh, code, which in the interest of time, I'm just going to grab uh, off of here. No, I actually don't. Um, so instead, I'll just go through the um, through these. I think I have already demonstrated the names function. This is very convenient for working with different data objects. I demonstrated it last week looking for um, <clears throat> looking for the names of rows and columns in a matrix. But uh, here we're going to use it to um, look at the names of variables in our data frame. So it's quite nice. We can um, use the names function. We can use it on my data. And uh, what happens is it, it prints out all of the names of the data frame in order. Oftentimes that's convenient, especially if you have more than you know, 10 or 12 names in your data frame, and maybe you're working with several data frames, um, that's very convenient. And we need, in order to access the data, we'll talk about this next, uh, in a few weeks when we have our next session, we have to know the names of the data to access them from inside data objects. A trick that we did last time is um, that we can actually manipulate these values using the, the container that is created by the names function for a particular data object. So uh, we can use it this way to merely print out the names. We could use it in a fundamentally different way. This is often very useful, especially if you have a, a data frame that's got some um, ugly names in it. <clears throat> So I've just copied and pasted the output and I'm just going to clean that up um, real quick so that it's easier to read. Um, let's say that we wanted to uh, change the ID to the um, GC ID because it was a gas chromatograph, chromatograph, what we could do is um, put this whole string of names into the names container, 321. The butler did the work. There's no output, but if we run line 44 again, 321, we see that the name has changed in our data object and we can in inspect it up here as well. So uh, it's quite a useful function that, um, yeah, you tend to use it a lot to keep track of where you're going. Another one is the structure function. And this in modern times, I uh, I reflect. We have less use for the structure function, but it's one that I used to use every R session. Um, may, not too many years ago. What it does is uh, when we do this, it will it will produce down in the terminal a summary of the um, kinds of variables. Uh, that we have for every variable in our data frame, what type of variable it is, and a few of the values. Um, so that if I run that three, two, one, we see it wraps around a little bit because I've got my my Windows um, magnification big. But if I pull it out like that, you can see it gives the uh, name, what kind of variable it is, and a few of the values. Well, the reason that it's not so useful anymore is that our studio does that for us by default now with a graphic 
interface that is is very easy to use. It's fast to use. So I find that I tend to use uh, even um, though I'm very set in my ways, I like to say when it comes to R, I tend to use the global environment for that these days, but it's still useful on occasion. Um, another thing is that uh, we have talked a little bit about indexes, but we're really going to do a deep dive on this next week. That's uh, in the next session. Remember, we talked about these square brackets as an index of, of um, where data are in a matrix. Well, the way we access specific rows and columns of data is exactly like that for data frames. So uh, if we used the, the um, square bracket notation, <clears throat> maybe I wanted to slice out you know, we'll we'll go through. That's what the whole of Bootcamp Lab Six is. If we wanted to slice out the second row and all the columns of my data for some reason, we'd specify the second row, comma, and uh, we wouldn't specify anything for the column. That implies that we want all the columns. So if I just show what that is with a little experiment, three, two, one, we get out the uh, names and the values of row two for every value. Treatment plan, RT, 16.24. Likewise, we could specify we want all the rows of column two. Um, that would be the AFID column, three, two, one. And we get all of the names. We could also specify that we want the treatment, but uh, we could use the name, treatment, in quotes, three, two, one. And we get all the treatments. So th this notation, is quite useful to exploit little subsets of the data. We use it constantly, in fact, and have a whole bootcamp session on it. And last but not least, we have the old attach. Um, what does the attach function do? Now, the use of attach is, um, is it's not something that um, is considered best practice. And what it does is, I have this metaphor that I have already told you about last time, the metaphor of R space. So imagine that you're floating in R space and you want to use some of the data that you've just read in. And uh, the metaphor goes like this, if you'll recall, that uh, anything floating around in R space with you that you can see without touching it in global environment. So we can see this container called my underscore data. We can see the container my data. We can see the container my data too, and we can see X. Maybe we want to use the data in those structures for something, but um, in order to use the variables that are inside of a data set, we can't see them without touching it. If we touch it, that's um, that's what the graphical user interface does to it. What if we want to use ID? Well, um, if we ask the butler, show me what's in ID. Three, two, one. And I can't. I don't see any ID. You're floating in our space. You can see everything, sir. I don't know where our ID is. So we have to have a way to access the variables that are inside here. Floating in our space, we can think of them like data frames, like boxes. And if you open the box, you can see the variables inside the box. Well, the handle to open the box for a, a single variable is the cache sign operator. So if we used um, the ID, uh, my data, <laughs> is the name of the box. Uh, cache sign opens the box, and we want to get at the variable called, um, now I've changed the name to GCID. I'm glad I looked at that. Uh, this will allow us to get at the, the data. So it, it prints it out, and now I know. But what if for some reason we didn't want to do that and we just wanted to say, listen, Butler, can I get you to just open the box and leave it open so I can see those variables? What we would do in this case, that's where the attach function comes in. With attach, we can um, attach my data and it's like opening the box so we can see all the variables in our space with us. It's the similar 
in metaphor for the graphic graphical user interface of doing that so that floating around on our space we can see everything so if i run that three two one and i uh want to see peak area now i can access peak area without um without uh, specifying the data frame this is not particularly um recommended because in a case just such as this where i have multiple data frames maybe they have different data uh, in them in this case they do have identical data but uh, maybe they have identical names so if i start attaching everything in my space uh, we can get confused about the variable names it's very easy to do that so there are two little ways to come around that if i attach my underscore data Oops, I spelled my I spelled underscore. If I do this again, three, two, one, it says, oh right, you've got some doubles in there. Um, well, I'll do it if you want me to. And so it's replaced the old names that I had attached in the global environment with the new ones. And this can be dangerous if it's not exactly the same data and you know you make a mistake in doing that. And then uh, another way that's probably slightly better is uh, we can detach the objects. This is the same as closing the box, three, two, one. We've detached it. Now, if we ask for peak area, three, two, one. Oh, we still get it for some reason. Uh, oh, it may be because, um, let's try this, detach and now peak area. Yes. So now uh, I had to detach both of them, both of the variables that I had attached. And now it says the peak area is not found. So it's a way to control the opening and closing of boxes with variables. We've gone very fast. We're out of time, but we've gotten through everything except for the um, the exercises. And and as usual, what I will do is I will invite you to um, to go to the exercise. We'll just have a quick peek. I was hoping George Wager would be here tonight because I found this picture. Uh, that for some reason at some point in the past she sent of her dog using our studio and i like that better than the duck picture that i've been using so i put that there for her benefit but she didn't come to see it so i'll i'll, I'll keep it on board for the future we just look at the um practice exercises the idea for these practice exercises tonight is to um, download a data set butterfly data in Excel and, and practice some of the um, functions that we've used. So you will need to think about things like um, your, your uh, working directory, the exact method that you're going to read in the data, whether it's from the menu or from code. And it asks you to use a few functions, like the mean function for particular subsets of the data. If you haven't coded along, or if this was all new to you, your, your benefit, you'll want to read and run the code in the lab. I did run through all of the, the code in the lab, but I didn't go through every single line of information. So that's it. This is the last time I'll see you for two weeks. I'm off to South Africa. Um, some of you I will see in the next couple of days while I'm still here. I'm going to stop the recording. And uh, 